uh, 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 Larry also emphasized, and, and you also emphasized the, uh, the difference between uh, the return to capital and the growth rate. And your, your, your argument is that the return to capital is too high compared to growth rate. Uh, maybe if that's the problem, then you know, we can try to increase the growth rate. A a and uh, one possibility you know, um, heavily emphasized by the current government is deregulation. Uh, I'm not sure whether we can show the uh, graph here. It was in my slide, but our you know, ranking in terms of uh, regulatory burden is miserable. A recent World Economic Forum showed that our ranking is 96, way behind you know, Singapore number two, uh, Malaysia number four, even China number 14. And our ranking is 96 out of maybe over 100 countries. So there is much room uh, there we can improve. But one difficulty uh, with deregulation is that sometimes, you know, in many cases, the interest group will resist to that kind of attempt. A and uh, sometimes it gets more difficult if the interest group are, you know, socially disadvantaged uh, people, right? So deregulation may, uh, you know, aggravate uh, income inequality issue uh, in, in that case. Um, but I think that, you know, we can try to avoid that kind of problem by uh, increasing maybe social expenditure to help those people who are uh, aggravate, uh, you know, adversely affected by deregulation. So that, let me ask Professor Piketty, what is your opinion about this kind of policy, you know, deregulation with, you know, social expenditure? Uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Now let me turn to Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff. You can respond to a question and you can raise your own voices also. I've been here too, too uh, few uh, days to really give much in the way of guidance to Korea, but um, except that I can tell you the country's doing extremely well compared to uh, just by casual observation. Uh, the country looks great. Things are, uh, you know, compared to the U.S., in many ways it's uh, just a marvel. And whatever you're doing, I would basically keep doing it. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, one issue is getting everybody to speak English so that people like I can, uh, like, uh, can <laughs> navigate better. But I think in general for the, pop, for the typical students coming up, pushing English uh, very, very, very hard is probably the first best thing you can do to improve uh, equality. Giving everybody the same education to a large extent through the Internet by putting the best lectures of the best teachers into this, all the classrooms throughout the country. That's a major step. Let me just now respond to, for just a minute or two to some of the things, uh, some of the responses of uh, Thomas. Uh, you know, it, you could say, well, some of the points I'm making are second order, they're not that important, there's, you know, by the, by the side. But if you look at the U.S. at least, the total private wealth the wealth numbers that Thomas is looking at, it's about $50 trillion in the hands of the public. If you look at the Social Security wealth of the public, well, if you don't forget, if you leave out the taxes, the present value is about $60 trillion. The Medicare benefits has a present value of around 60, Medicare and Medicaid benefits have a present value of about $60 trillion. So the big picture is actually in terms of wealth, you know, the fact that the government took money from people when they were young, called it taxes, and is giving it back to them in the form of these benefits, uh, it doesn't change the reality that we could call that taxation private saving. And we could call these social security benefits to which people have claims and medical benefits to which people have claims in old age, uh, also private wealth. And if we pick later, so I would, would encourage Thomas to to focus on that as well uh, to get a better, better overall picture. Now, R minus G, you know, I was also trying to point out that, that in, in a life cycle model of the kind that takes into account all these complexities 
of how many kids you have and when you die and who you marry and how many times you get divorced. You know, if you put together a simulation study, there's other ways to study inequality than just look at data which may be poorly defined or may be partial or may be poorly collected. You can also try and learn something through economic simulation models that, that have reasonable calibrations. And you do find that if you expand R and hold G fixed in these models, nothing happens to wealth inequality in a life cycle model that has uh, the ability to explain the top tail of the wealth distribution and also the Gini coefficient. Uh, and that you do see that the driving force is wage inequality. So where is wage inequality coming from? And in Korea, in our country, it's coming from smart machines taking over everybody's job, left, right, and center. We have uh, Google wanting to have all the taxi cab drivers put out of business, all the truck drivers put out of business with cars that will drive and trucks that will drive themselves. We have the head of Amazon trying to put everybody out of business when, who's delivering uh, parcels, uh, packages, because they want to have drones drop those things right on our, in our so this has major implications. The competition countries are facing, developing countries are, developed countries are facing with foreigners uh, because of the help of the internet and because of faster physical transportation. All this has a role to play in why the US wage inequality has gotten worse and how are we gonna turn that around? And I think the key thing is education and uniform education Uniform education means using the internet to give everybody the same education to a very large extent. So that's what I would recommend uh, for Korea and for any country, certainly starting with my own country. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Tom, you have uh, five minutes. Okay. Um, so, you know, re regarding the conclusions for Korea and, and inequality and what we can do, let, let me make very clear that, uh, you know, I... I, I I'm eager to learn more about Korea. I'm eager to see more data on Korea, to, to put more in, on Korea in the future edition of the book. And, you know, I'm, I'm not here to give lessons or to say, okay, this is what should be done. L let me just mention a couple of points. I think, you know, investment in education in the long run is certainly the key force to reduce inequality. From what I understand, you know, Korea uh, is a country that has, in a way, you know, very, very good outcomes in terms of education, test scores, but it is also one of the OECD countries where uh, private households are paying the most for the education of their children, and, you know, maybe, you know, uh, more public investment uh, would be a way to have sort of more inclusive uh, society and, uh, and, and and at the same time, more equality in the long run and higher growth, because at the, at the end of the day, it's really investment in education and productivity that delivers uh, more growth. So, uh, yes, we, when, when we compare R and G, you know, we want to increase the G, and investing in education is critical for this, and I think public investment in education could probably be higher and probably will be higher at some point in, in Korea than what it is uh, today. So that's, that's very important. And another l lesson from the history of uh, other countries that uh, I think can be useful for Korea is that if you look at uh, very top income earners, uh, education is not the only mechanism that's important. You know, probably, I, you know, I don't know, but it's quite striking to see that the very top income shares, as we've seen, has increased in Korea uh, more than in countries like Japan or most European countries, you know, less than in the US, but probably more than in some other countries. And Korea is also the country where, uh, you know, the decline in top tax rate uh, for very top incomes uh, uh, between 1980 and 2010 has been one of the strongest. You know, this is, has been a huge decline. And I think, you know, this is probably uh, contributing to... Um, rising inequality at the very top. In particular, what we've observed in the using US data is that uh, you know, top managers uh, tend to bargain much more aggressively uh, with a top tax rate of 30 or 40 percent than with a top tax rate of 60 or 70 percent. So above a certain level of managerial compensation, uh, it can be actually useful uh, to have relatively high top tax rate in order to limit uh, you know, the, the, the rise of top managerial competition. Uh, again, it's all a matter of degree. Uh, is it useful to pay managers 10 million rather than 1 million dollars? You know, it's not so clear. 
So I, I think this is an issue that, that you know, is worth thinking about in the Korean uh, context. Finally, regarding uh, uh, wealth taxation, uh, you know, le let me again emphasize that the, the, the objective is really progressive wealth tax. So you know, zero tax. On, you know, in, in the US, the bottom 90% of the population has almost you know, very little wealth, you know, 20, 25% of total wealth for the bottom 90%, that's really very small. So they have social security, which is great, they have Medicare, which is great, but you know, sometimes they would also like to access property and to, to have, uh, to have uh, you know, home and not only a big mortgage that is sometimes bigger than the value of their home. And, and in order to, you know, to help them, and also in Korea, I think a um, you know, more progressive tax system, in particular on wealth, is, can be important. Last word on, on wealth taxation. To me, the even more important part is really information. So taxation can produce better data, better information, uh, so that we can adapt our policies. And, but it's important to realize that if you have no wealth tax at all, or you know, in countries where there's no inheritance tax at all, there is an inheritance tax in Korea, although I've, I've not seen uh, uh, inheritance tax statistics being used to study the, the, the dynamics of wealth inequality in Korea, but you know, maybe I don't know the, these uh, studies. Uh, I, I think it's important to, to, uh, you know, to produce more information so that we can have an informed debate, and you know, maybe we will conclude that the tax rate on very top wealth holders don't need to be high because you know they are just growing as much as the rest of the country and you know of course we need very rich people we need uh, you know we but you know it's just that the, the growth, distribution of growth must be uh, more balanced than it is uh, sometimes you know in, in this country and in other countries as well uh, how about uh, the question from Dr. Shin about deregulation or...? Okay, so, you know, I, I believe in competition, uh, you know, to promote uh, growth and, and, you know, when you have too little competition, you know, in, in my country, uh, you know, promoting more competition, uh, you know, in the taxi area or in the other areas, you know, is very useful. Now, I have just two, two, two caveats to this, is that first, even if you uh, deregulate, even if you promote competition, uh, that's probably not going to be enough to have a growth rate of 5% forever. So, you know, even with the perfect competition policy, even with the perfect investment in education, uh, right now, you know, you say the, uh, uh, you know, Korea is, a, is an underdeveloped country. Well, you know, this is a very rich underdeveloped country. You know, you have... A, uh, you know, per capita GDP is around maybe thirty thousand dollars. So, you know, if you compare to, to Japan or European countries, I guess you are about at seventy-five uh, percent of the of the highest per capita GDP. So, you know, if you grow at five percent per year, and the other countries are growing at one percent, uh, you can see that you know it will take five or ten years to get to one hundred percent. So. Uh, uh, you know, it's quite likely that this is not going to continue for 20 or 30 years, well, unless your target is to be at 150% of Japan in terms of per capita GDP, but, you know, I don't know if that's a reasonable target. So probably, you know, even with the best competition policy, the best education policy in the world, the growth rate will probably not be 5% for, forever. Finally, you know, sometimes too much deregulation in some sectors, in particular in finance, you know, is not always good. And I think, you know, financial deregulation, when, when it is excessive, has actually contributed to, to rising inequality, uh, uh, and this plays an important role in my book, both because of very large uh, uh, bonuses uh, in the finance uh, sector, but also because financial deregulation has probably contributed to rising inequality in access to high rate of return. So, you know, when we talk about RNG, you know, the rate of return for uh, middle class uh, saving uh, in Korea or in France, you know, is sometimes not so good. You know, people get uh, not such a good rate of return. Uh, well, it has very large diversified portfolios uh, investing in uh, sophisticated financial products, uh, derivatives, etc., can get very high return. And I think the regulation in the financial sector sometimes you know, it's contributed to rising inequality with uh, little benefit for the real economy and for the real growth performance of our economy. So, 
okay, I like, you know, competition is good, but we should be careful about excessive financial deregulation. Thank you very much uh, for Piketty, Kotlikov, and all the discussants. And let me finish the second round here. And I'll open the floor for the third round shortly. But uh, here we have two important issues. One is growth, the other is equality. And they can be mutually re, uh, reinforcing. High growth can lead to better equality. So the thing is that how we can find the right solution. And Piketty says that uh, Korea is about 75% of Japan in terms of per capita income. Yes, you want to become world richest country and world equal, most equal country. But I don't know whether we will succeed. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, open the floor of, uh, for the general audience. Now this third round. And I want to, you to keep your question in one minute. Let me first uh, go to Professor Nang Nyon Kim from Dongguk University, over there. Uh, can you help mic, microphone? Uh, uh, I'm the Piketty professor, I'll go to the Chinese Piketty professor's top income share of the top income share. 어, 기존, 지금까지 어떤 그 소득 불평등에 관한 인식은 가계 조사에 의해서 그러니까 어떤 대화 왔었는데 피케티 교수께서는 어, 그러니까 소득세자를 위해서 타빈컴 쉐어에 대한 어, 그, 그, 그러니까 새롭게 개발하셨고 막 그것에 의해서 여러 가지 아, 아, 막 새, 새로운 어떤 인식을 장을 열었다고 생각합니다. 에, 그런데 그러니까 제가 질문 드리고자 하는 것은 아, 상위 1%라든지 탑 인컴 쉐어에 주목을 하게 되면 어, 예를 들어서 대부분의 사람들의 경우는 어, 그러니까 뭐 그러니까 그, 거기에 포함되지 못합니다. 어, 어, sorry. 야, 이게 좀 바꿔 주실 수 있어요? 잘안 들립니다. 네. 그러면 자. 예. Yeah. Now, can you hear? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to say that I have a question. 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 I have 어, 피케티 혁명이라고도 뭐 이, 이, 이해되고 있습니다. 근데 이제 제가 드리고 싶은 질문은 어, 상위 1%라고 이렇게 보통 10% 정도까지 이렇게 국한하시는데 대부분의 사람들은 어, 그 이하에 있는 사람들이 거기에 포함되지 않습니다. 그래서 지금까지 자료상으로 보면 어, 역사적인 어떤 통계를 그러니까 장기적으로 추적했기 때문에 에, 막 그게 불가피했다 생각합니다만은 근래에는 에, 그러니까 그 그러니까 면세점 이하의 계층까지도 소수 통계에서 어, 그러니까 그 잡히는 경우가 그러니까 일반적으로 생각합니다. 그렇게 된다고 한다면은 어, 탑 인컴스 계층만이 아니고 어, 미들이라든지 바텀 인컴의 계층까지도 확장할 수 있는 어떤 것이 가능하다고 저는 생각을 하고 있습니다. 그럴 때 아, 지금까지 탑 인컴에만 포커스를 맞춘 것보다는 좀더 실태를 더잘알수 있다고 생각하고 뭐 이런 점에서 그러니까 그 그러니까 피켓 교수님이 지금까지 했던 탑 인컴뿐만 아니고 그 밑에까지 확장하는 것이 저는 가능하다 고 생각하는데 이 부분에 대해서 어떻게 생각하시는지 아, 좀 여쭤고 싶습니다. I, I completely agree with you. I, I, I think, uh, okay, so in, in the book, I try to distinguish between uh, different groups throughout society. So you have, you know, the top 10%, including the top 1%. You have the bottom 50%. And you have the, what I call the middle 40%, what I call sometimes the middle class in the book, which are the people who are not in the bottom 50% and who are not in the top 10%. And of course, we care about the entire distribution. And, you know, in a way, you know, I care much more about what's going to the bottom 50% than, than about the top share per se. And, and the only reason I am interested in the uh, top share is because this can have an impact on what's left uh, for, for the bottom 50%. 
So I, I, I am very happy that the income tax data is now being used uh, for Korea and, and you know, congratulations uh, uh, to you and uh, other people who are using uh, this data. I think uh, indeed this allows to, to, to provide a more realistic picture of the top. You know, the problem with household uh, uh, survey and self-reported data is that, you know, very high income and even more so very high wealth people don't report uh, uh, always what they should in a household survey. And so administrative, uh, exhaustive data, you know, it's not perfect either, but it's a bit better and it provides uh, more realistic information. But ultimately, the objective is to put together all these data source to have a, you know, a complete view of the bottom, the middle, uh, and, and the top of the, of the distribution. And, you know, we will keep put, to put online, uh, you know, updated data. And our objective in the next years or so is to put online series about the bottom shares for bottom decile as much as for the top share. So we are very much following your advice. Yeah, let, me, let me just add, uh, let me just add one thing to, uh, Thomas's uh, appeal for, for better and more data on income and, and clearly wealth. I think what we really should be measuring is what we really care about is consumption. Think about Warren Buffett. This is a guy with about, about $50 billion. From everything I could tell, he doesn't spend it very much, it, much of it at all. I think he eats in the same restaurant he did when he was, you know, not wealthy. Uh, his consumption is relatively s low. So if we really want to understand what we really care about, it's consumption inequality, not income inequality or wealth inequality, because if you really want to study, if you want to try and get indirectly to consumption inequality, spending inequality, you have to incorporate everything. You can't leave out, in the US case, more than half the wealth just because the government calls it uh, government benefits. You know, when the government in the US collects 15.3% of everybody's, of the low and middle class workers' salary, every time they get a paycheck, 15.3%, and then uses that to give them benefits later in life, they don't have money, much money left over to save out of in terms of buying stocks and bonds and real estate. So we can't ignore the, that form of wealth. It's a major form of wealth. It's the most important form of wealth for the poor and the middle class. If we want to talk about overall true wealth inequality, but why do we really care about true wealth inequality? It's ultimately to get to consumption inequality. What we really care about is who gets to drive around in the Mercedes or the very fancy Kia or Hyundai. Okay. Um, so that's what we should measure. Yeah, now Tom wants to respond also. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to make the simple point that, of course, we care a lot about consumption. We need to take transfer into account, etc. But I think wealth is also uh, about uh, power, and the ownership of wealth and capital is also about power and how you share power in, in companies. And, you know, w Warren Buffett was complaining that he was paying too little tax, that he was paying less tax than his secretary. And I, I think he was right that, you know, when you have excessive concentration of wealth, even if the consumption the private consumption in restaurant of Warren Buffett does not increase, the concentration of power can increase to some level that can be uh, excessive. So, you know, consumption for very, very top wealth uh, people is not just food or restaurants. You know, you can consume uh, politicians, you can consume academics, you can consume uh, lots of things uh, which are nice to consume when you are wealthy. You know, food is not, is not interesting anymore. So, uh, uh, you know, I think wealth is a good indicator of power, of your ability mm -hmm. to consume different goods and services, and we need to take that into account for, uh, you know, a fair and efficient tax system as much as uh, income and, and consumption. Okay, thank you. Now, let's on to uh, Mr. Dongman Kim from Federation of Korea Labor Unions, President. Yeah, Piketty goes to Pangab Smida. Piketty Yelpungan, Sagazik in Pulpengdangwa, Yangakaya Kira Nagopomida. A Hangong Yoshi, Yangakaman Jaga to Shinga Kamida. E. Hexim Oninan, Ingum Nodongja, Chelbanega Kaun, 
800만 명 이상이 비정규직이고 이들의 임금은 정규직의 55% 수준에 불과합니다. 그리고 대학을 졸업하고도 많은 청년들이 양질의 일자리보다는 아르바이트와 인턴 등 불안정한 일자리로 취업하는 등 불평등하고 취약한 노동시장 구조에 있다고 생각을 합니다. 이같이 심각한 한국의 노동시장 구조를 개선하는 대책과 그리고 평등하고 정의로운 세계를 만들기 위한 노동조합에 대한 역할과 노동운동에 대한 조언을 해주시면 감사하겠습니다. 다음. Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to say anything controversial, and I, you know, I know too little about, uh, you know, the Korean labor market and and current debate uh, with the trade union to to take a specific stance. L let me, you know, just say that the, you know the evidence from many um, um, European countries and many countries in the world is that, uh, you know, unions uh, and and more generally, uh, you know. Uh, um, um, good uh, labor market status and a, a more uh, balanced uh, distribution of power in companies, uh, you know, can be an asset for growth and development and it's not necessarily a, a liability. And, you know, I can tell you, for instance, that right now in France, uh, you know, uh, people are looking much more closely at the uh, uh, German uh, models of, uh, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, how you organize boards in companies where, as you know, uh, uh, you know union representative and worker representative uh, have um, uh, seats uh, in uh, the board of Volkswagen and other German companies and are very much involved in the uh, decision making uh, in these companies. Uh, and uh, the fact that shareholders don't have all the power uh, in German companies, apparently, is not preventing them from producing good cars. So, uh, and, and there is serious discussion in France to change the law. Right, uh, so far in France, you know, worker representative and union representative don't have a say in boards. Well, they don't have a vote. They are just purely uh, consultative. Uh, uh, whereas in, in, in Germany, they participate to the vote, mm -hmm. even if they don't have stake in the capital of the company. Um, and uh, and we are thinking of changing the law in France because, you know, instead of having unions uh, uh, only in the streets, uh, having them in the boards of companies and, and uh, you know, having a more balanced uh, distribution of power in companies and, and unions negotiating, you know, it can be an asset for, for growth and, and uh, uh, you know, I don't know how, how useful this is in the Korean context, but certainly there's been a lot of anti-union uh, ideology uh, in the past, which uh, I think... Uh, Uh, maybe not in Korea, but in some other countries, has been, uh, uh, you know, unhelpful for uh, for the future of, of growth and development. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let's turn the mic to uh, Ms. Sunju Kwon, the president of uh, IBK, Industrial Bank of Korea. Ah, uh, yeah, PKT 교수님 강의 잘 들었습니다. Uh, 제 나름대로 요약을 해보니까 그 프로그레시브 웰스 택세이션 이런 제도가 부의 이동성을 증가를 시키고 이거를 통해서 웰스 디스트리뷰션을 가능하게 하고 결과적으로는 소셜 이니퀄리티를 해소한다라는 그런 말씀으로 저를 이해를 했습니다. 한국에서는 특이하게 2천만 원이 넘는 금융소득에 대해서는 그 파이낸셜 인컴에 대해서 컴프리엔시브하게 어, 추가적으로 어, 과세를 하는 제도를 가지고 있습니다. 어, 이러한 제도는 좀 특이하고 어, 또 이러한 어, 부의 에, 불평등을 해소하는 하나의 방안이라고 저는 생각을 합니다. 아, 그러나 근본적으로는 어, 이러한 누진세, 누진적인 부유세보다는 그 소득의 하위 계층들이 소득의 상위 계층으로 이동할 수 있는 소득의 이동성을 증진하는 것이 보다 공평한 사회로 가는 장기적으로 좋은 방법이라고 저는 생각을 합니다. 여기에 대해서 교수님의 견해를 듣고 싶습니다. 감사합니다. Well, I, I think we need to do both. I mean, you need to promote, uh, you know, better uh, paying jobs at the bottom and investment in education and, and labor market reform uh, to, to against, you know, the, 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 in order to make sure that, that 
you know, the people have access to better job, and at the same time, you know, you need, uh, you need progressive uh, taxation. You know, I, I think when, when you move to a, a, a world with, a, a, you know, in a more mature economy, as, uh, as uh, one uh, present, uh, presentation was saying, where you have a, a lower growth in the long run and a higher uh, stock of wealth relative to income, you know, it makes sense to uh, uh, tax income flow and particular labor income flow a bit less and to tax uh, wealth stock uh, con uh, accumulated in the past a bit, a bit more. And, and, you know, it's not a question of having uh, uh, all the tax on wealth, or not, but just the balance need to shift a little bit in the direction of wealth taxation in a world where the wealth to income ratio is higher, uh, at least you know for the high level of wealth inequalities that we that we typically uh, observe, and so reducing uh, uh, labor income tax uh, uh, and compensated by slightly more uh, progressive uh, mm. uh, wealth taxation, you know, can be a way to increase uh, mobility together with education policy, labor market policy, you know, we don't need to choose between these different policies. They are all useful and complementary. Thank you. Uh, let me turn now to the, the not yet, uh, the questions that we have received through SMS. And uh, can you put on the list of the questions? I will, we have uh, here about 10 questions, but we cannot accommodate all of them. So I will just pick two of them. and. Thomas Piketty will give us his answers. One first question is that uh, Thomas Piketty, Professor Piketty, you yourself must belong to 1% of top income group. <laughs> Do you understand the life of 99%? <laughs> Can you answer that? A accumulating uh, statistics uh, is not the only way to mm. understand the okay. bottom 99%. So, you know, I, so I, I certainly don't pretend that this is uh, enough. Um, uh, you know, so I try in my book, you know, to also use other types of evidence. You know, I use, mm. uh, uh, I, I think it's important to study representations of inequality in political debate, also in the literature that is playing an important role in my book because, you know, I think the story of money and inequality is too important to be left to statisticians and economists. You know, I think it, uh, it, it, people have very strong views about inequality because first they feel what it means from their position, they feel the, you know, the difference in purchasing power, the difference in power. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so I, I try in my book to tell uh, you know, sort of a lively story uh, in inequality, but, you know, I, I certainly don't pretend that accumulating uh, statistics and equation is enough. And, uh, uh, and it's certainly, you know, what I care about ultimately is to try to contribute mm -hmm. to a better debate and to, okay. to try to contribute to design of policies so that, you know, people don't need to, uh, to write a, a bestseller uh, in order to have okay. a decent income. Thank you. Let's go, uh, go to question number three. Uh, you may al uh, have already given some answers, but you, your proposal to impose high income, progressive income, and wealth tax, uh, wouldn't it kill uh, both that laid gold egg? Sorry, w I wouldn't it, you, your proposal to tax high income or wealth, then may kill a boat that lays gold eggs? What do you think about it? The entrepreneurs. Oh, yeah, you know, it, again, it's a matter of degree. I think you don't want to reduce uh, inequality to, to zero. You know, that will be bad for, for growth. So it's really a matter of degree. So, you know, I don't have a, a mathematical formula to tell you where is the tipping point where inequality becomes excessive. I think all what we have collectively is historical evidence and comparative evidence. And I think we can learn from this but that's where we will always have disputes about where is the tipping point because you know we will never be completely sure what one thing i have learned from the from the my historical research is that you know the kind of extreme concentration of wealth that we had in pretty much every country and in particular every european country up until world war 1 was excessive you know it was not useful for growth it okay. was, uh, you know, it was reduced by very large shocks, by the wars, by the Great Depression, much bigger than the 
the Asian financial crisis of 1998. It was also reduced by policies, big change in policies. Uh, you know, the income tax in France was not accepted by the elite until 1914, and after World War I and World War II, it was accepted, the welfare state. And, and you know, we don't want to return to the kind of extreme wealth concentrations that we had mm -hmm. uh, prior to World War I. I'm, I'm not saying this will happen, but, you know, we need to think seriously about this and, and, and we need to realize that, you know, competition, mm -hmm. growth, etc., is not sufficient to avoid that kind of, of uh, outcome, uh, uh, you know, and I'm just saying this, you know, on the basis of this historical evidence that I have tried to, to, to collect and we should try to move beyond ideology and, and look at this data together. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, finally, we will uh, open the floor for general audience. There are many people who are eager to raise voices. Uh, we can accommodate three. Keep your question in 30 seconds. Okay, go, go, you first, because we have been insisting. I am Yu Jong Song from Australian National University. Uh, the key question comes to uh, uh, whether to uh, increase G or decrease R, whether to promote, in, promote growth or equality. But many experiences, many country experiences shows actually inequality is harmful for growth and equality promotes growth. So it's not coincidence that Korea, also Taiwan, had profound land reform before high growth uh, took place. It's not coincidence. Now Korea experiences low growth when inequality is rising. So to me, it seems that promoting equality is the key to promoting growth. And uh, that comes to the role of politics. So the uh, the world income inequality, uh, the trend, the decreasing inequality during the 20th century is not just because of two world wars, Can you but keep because it of uh, development of welfare capitalism. So uh, what do you think? Okay, Minister Chu. Here, please. Hey, here you are. In front. I've learned a lot from uh, Professor Piketty's uh, insightful presentation and ensuing equally stimulating and uh, lively uh, panel and flow discussion. I presume that your timely visit to Korea will certainly reignite the already heated debate on income and worse uh, inequality in Korea. I'd like to ask uh, a, a couple of uh, quick questions to you. Uh, number one, uh, given the fact that in many uh, emerging market economies, uh, the rate of growth is greater than the rate of return on capital, does your key finding that the rate of return on uh, capital exceeds uh, the rate of growth apply only to mature advanced uh, economies? As uh, Professor Joe uh, clearly shows, uh, in our case, except for the first uh, several years, the rate of growth always exceeds the rate of return. Uh, even in, especially uh, in the context of emerging market economies, where uh, the rate of growth exceeds the rate of return on capital, I wonder the imposition of uh, a global wealth tax, however progressive it may be, uh, may weaken economic growth and, as a result, reduce the, the overall fire of wealth. So I believe instead of punishing, instead of pursuing policies, uh, punishing capital accumulation, it would be more important in emerging market economic context uh, to come up with and implement policies that will increase the productivity of labor uh, by education and job training, as well as uh, making sure that 
opportunities in labor and product market mm -hmm. are uh, equ uh, equally shared. Okay. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, know uh, your take on minimum wage increase. Mm -hmm. uh, some people argue that the minimum wage increase uh, can reduce income inequality. However, in accordance with your claim that the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor is greater than one, uh, labor can be uh, replaced by capital, which is uh, translated into reduced uh, number of job opportunities. So I would be very much interested in knowing uh, your views on the need for minimum wage increase. Okay, thank you. Now, Minister Chu took three persons' time, so I'm sorry, we have to cut short here. So you can voice your issues later. Uh, so I will give you the final response. Okay, so thanks for this uh, very, very interesting and important question. Uh, le let me start with the first one. Yeah, I think the rise of welfare capitalism uh, uh, was very important in the reduction of inequality. And, you know, World War I, uh, World War II were important uh, per se because of the shocks and destruction of capital. But, you know, this was a very tragic way to reduce inequality. And in the long run, the much more positive and important way was the rise of institutions, uh, and, 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 you know, I think we, we need to, 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 to understand that these institutions are fragile and they are always a product of particular compromise in different countries and, and they are also very important, uh, you know, for our common uh, future. Now, regarding the, the second question, or in fact the three sub-questions of the second questions, uh, you know, there's a very important question which is the uh, wealth tax useful for emerging countries or after all, you know, emerging economy should only care about growth and, and promote growth and invest in education. And, you know, I think we, we, we can do both. You know, I think we need to invest in education, promote growth, but at the same time, you know, growth is not going to continue at five or 10 percent forever. Uh, that's one thing, particularly in, in, you know, poor countries like Korea, which are already very rich and which are not so poor anymore. Um, I think even in China, you know, where growth is going to continue for a long time, you know, because China is not at 75% of the per capita GDP of uh, Japan, and so very fast growth is probably going to continue for a long time. You know, nobody knows 10, 20, 30, but probably for a long time. But even in China, I think wealth inequality is becoming an important issue. You know, when you have very wealthy, uh, you know, oligarchs, uh, uh, not only in Russia, but also in China that are taking, uh, you know, huge wealth sometimes, you know, I think fighting corruption uh, is not going to be enough. You know, I think it's good to fight corruption and, you know, to put oligarchs in jail from time to time, but I don't think this is an efficient way to regulate uh, the accumulation and distribution of wealth. And I think progressive wealth taxation is a much better way than just, you know, putting people in jail from time to time. And I think mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, much more efficient because it allows you first to treat, you know, the entire distribution, to produce information about what's going on in your country, and, you know, sometime in China, nobody really knows what's going on to the distribution and how extreme is the rise of inequality. Certainly, there's more rising inequalities than in the official statistics, but nobody really knows how much. And, I, yeah, I think uh, that will be important for China. And, in fact, there are debates in China right now about the introduction of at least some forms of property tax. And I think a, a more comprehensive wealth tax will be better than just a property tax. But, you know, it's a matter of debate. Uh, I think, of course, these issues will become even more important when, when the growth rate will be lower. Now, to answer your question about R versus G in very high growth economies, okay, so according to economic theory and economic models, you know, R should always be bigger than G, including when G is 5 or 10 percent. Uh, and in, in the standard accounting framework, uh, it could be that, you know, when you have very high growth rate, like uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, China or co Korea, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or even today. In fact, because you start from a low capital to income ratio, uh, you know, the average rate of return, if you take into account not only mm -hmm. interest, but also corporate profits, dividend, rental income, and you divide the total capital share in the economy by a low capital stock, 
then in fact the average rate of return is, is even bigger than 5 or 10 percent. You know, sometimes it can be 15 mm -hmm. percent. So now is this really a rate of return, a pure rate of return to capital or is this more entrepreneurial labor? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a complicated, so I, I have this discussion in the book and I think at the end I mostly agree with you that uh, R bigger than G is, mo is more of an issue in lower growth uh, uh, economies. Finally, regarding the minimum wage, mm -hmm. you know, you cannot raise the minimum wage too much. You know, if you multiply the minimum wage and it gets higher than the average wage of your country, you know, of course you have a problem. So it's all a matter of, of degree. You know, I, I took the example of the United States earlier because, you know, this is a country where I think the minimum wage could be increased, uh, not infinitely, but, you know, I don't think this will, this will cut, uh, uh, you know, employment really because the minimum wage, at least at the federal level, is really low in the U.S. as compared to average productivity, average wage. At the same time, you know, it's easier to increase the minimum wage if you invest more in education so that people can uh, take jobs that have a higher productivity. You know, if you just increase the minimum wage and don't invest in higher skill and, and better paid jobs, uh, you know, at some point, of course, you have a, you have a problem. So again, you know, you, d you have progressive taxation, you have education, you have the minimum wage, you have many other policies. You know, there's a whole set of policies that are complementary to one another uh, rather than substitute. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm really sad to conclude, to finish this uh, conversation because of time limit, because the conversation is getting really interesting now. Uh, we have to cut short here. And I want to thank all the participants, uh, but uh, we want to draw two lessons. One is for economists, for scholars. We should engage in more painstaking work on collecting data and evidence and build good theories to come up with good policy proposals. Second, uh, we sort of agree that the education or human capital or ability enhancing Policies are very important, key to both growth and reduction in inequality. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, with this, we'll conclude this session. Thank you.